Hello everyone, so this next video is going to be about the January 2019 PF topic, which is resolved the United States federal government should prioritize reducing the federal debt over promoting economic growth. So let's just start off with the wording of the resolution. And I guess the biggest problem with this topic, like most of the topics, is just the fact that the wording is very vague. Uh, number one, there are two different metrics for how economic growth is measured or how it's defined. And similarly, what exactly it constitutes the national debt. So things to remember, at least for the neg side, in defining economic growth is that you can always just, you also have to really specify exactly how is economic growth measured and how exactly should we define economic growth. Is it going to be an increase in per capita GDP or just GDP in general, things like that. So NEG could always just provide the overview that economic growth, regardless of how small it is, on, bet, on net is better than any reduction of the national debt. So essentially, like even if I'm increasing the, econ um, like the overall GDP of the United States by 0.0001%, that's still better than eliminating all of the national debt. And I think that would work really well as long as you could prove that with your case. Uh, similarly for national debt, um, how much should we reduce it by, how much, or like what would we spend this extra money on, things like that are really important considerations, especially for AF. Um, and AF could even provide the overall overview that any reduction in debt, regardless of how small, is better than economic growth. Um, so it's kind of similar to what I was talking about for NEG. You just apply that same logic for AF. And so during the summary, it's also important to remember that you should mention the harms of not voting for your side versus the harms of voting for the other side. So essentially what this means is usually in the summary, you'll get up and you'll say, here are the reasons why you should not vote for the other uh, side or your opponents. But here, what you should basically be saying is that here's what, e like, here are the, like, the harms if you don't vote for us. So because of that, you're going to see that there isn't going to be much clash. Because technically, like any reduction in national debt, sure, it might be good. And any reduction in economic growth is also arguably good or increase in economic growth is all arguably good. Um, but the problem is it really comes down to, you know, your impacts and like who who's impacted more and the magnitude and scope of those impacts. So think about the time frame, which is also like a really important issue, especially for this resolution. Because like sure, if I can like if I can prove that any reduction in national debt is going to like increase the per capita GDP of every single person in the United States by like 50% and you're able to like find some crazy statistic like that and it works. The problem is that if those impacts don't materialize until like 50 years later, but NEG's impacts are like materialize in like 10 years, obviously the judge is going to vote for the one that happens in 10 years just because of time frame. Now let's talk about definitions. So these are gonna seem like very broad, obvious definitions, but I think it's still important to go over these because any change in definitions could really alter how the round goes. Number one, let's talk about the word should. So should really implies like a kind of moral obligation because voting one way or another will pose like a net benefit to the American people. Um, similarly, there's also prioritize. So prioritize is basically like, you know, which one is more important? So you can have both happening at the same time. You know, you can have the economy growing while reducing the national debt, but which one is more important is um, essentially what you were arguing for. And economic growth is usually measured as an increase in the amount of goods and services produced per head of the population over a period of time. But the biggest thing is like it's measured using the GDP or the real GDP. Um, and so similarly, national debt is just like unpaid borrowed funds carried by the federal government. Um, and so these are like, like borrowed funds from countries like China or like the UK, things like that. Another really important consideration, which I know is probably going to show up in at least like a few rounds, you don't have to prove how you reduce the debt or increase economic growth. That's not your burden to prove. Essentially, what you're arguing is you're going to be fiating this entire thing, which means that you're going to assume that, the, that you are going to reduce the national debt or you're going to see an increase in economic growth. It doesn't matter how, it's just the fact is, is that it happens. And so...
it's really important to just you know weigh the impacts because that's I think that's really what Browns are going to come down to because you know you don't really have to prove how you get to that endpoint you just need to prove that that endpoint is better than any other impacts that your opponents can give you. Additional information to just consider, I think these are important terms and just economic theories that are going to be bounced around a lot during the round. Number one is Keynesian economics. I think that's how you say it, but essentially what this is, is this government spending money is good. And like, just because it can stimulate economic growth. And this is essentially what Roosevelt used during the Great Depression when he came up with all of these New Deal programs. And so he argued that, you know, by borrowing funds and by putting ourselves into more debt, you know, it's fine because we're going to be stimulating economic growth. And when we stimulate economic growth, not only are we going to see like a benefit for the average American person, but you're also going to be able to pay back that debt just because you're able to generate more profit. And I think AF and NEG can play into this model, but I think I would be wary of it for the NEG. Uh, so just because like AF can basically say that, you know, you can reduce the debt now so we can be prepared for like recessions to take on that debt. Meaning that, you know, like there is a recession that might happen like within like the next like 10 or 20 years. And so it's important that when we reduce this debt now, like it's it's better so that way we can yeah take on more debt from other countries so that way we can stimulate the economy much like we did during the Great Depression. NEG, I think it also works, but I'd also be really wary just because you can argue that national debt is good because we're experiencing growth. However, this is also like a matter of causation or correlation. You know, you don't necessarily know if the fact that we have national debt is the sole reason that we are experiencing growth. Or it, does it just happen to be another factor or just like something random that happens to be there while we're experiencing economic growth? Another important economic theory that might be considered is just the crowding out effect. Essentially what this is, is the rising public spending, sector spending drives down or even eliminates private sector spending. Um, I don't exactly understand like the basics of this, but you can always feel free to just look it up on Google. But essentially what you can say is that increased government spending towards reducing the debt reduces overall like sp uh, spending done by the private sector. And so this is exactly what you would argue for NEG. Um, if you were going to like, you know, essentially say that the private sector is like, you know, the most important driving factors of global economy. However, if you affirm you're going to be reducing the national debt, which means that the government is going to be spending more on reducing the national debt. But that means that the private sector or the, like the motor of our economy isn't going to be doing any investing, which means that by reducing the national debt, you're essentially going to be creating another recession, potentially. Another important consideration is just consider the rhetoric of the current administration, especially because we, you know, we have a conservative president and we also have a conservative Supreme Court that also is going to play into factors of like, you know, what economic theories are we going to be putting into place. Um, but also, it's also really interesting just because, you know, in January, we're also going to see an increasingly like liberal or democratic uh, Congress, which was also going to impact, you know, how the budget is going to work out and things like that. Um, so now here's just some general background information about the national debt. Just note that the national debt has been increasing and has been passed down from president to president. So essentially it accumulates and doesn't always just reset after a new president starts his or her term. Um, another thing is also national debt has also been increasing, but you don't necessarily know by what metric because there's always inflation happening. So you don't really know if like if you say like Trump has increased the national debt by 100 percent. The problem is you don't really know if it's 100 percent based on what standards. And so now let's look at um, historically some important things like FDR. Uh, FDR increased the national debt substantially for the New Deal programs in order to stimulate that economic growth, much, much like we see with like, the Keynesian economic theory and things like that. Similarly, you also have Truman, who reduced the national debt substantially because of World War II, actually, and spending more money for the Korean War and things like that. Um, similarly, you also need to consider that we did have a surplus at one point, especially during the Clinton era, just because of increased taxes. But now, you know, like I mentioned earlier, you need to consider that we have a conservative president and we have a conservative court.
And so what exactly does this mean in terms of taxes and like how much does the average citizen pay and how much of this tax money is actually going towards reducing the national debt or stimulating economic growth? Now let's talk about economic growth. So like I mentioned earlier, it's usually measured using the percent increase in GDP. Um, basically, the Fed is like another important aspect when considering economic growth, which is essentially the central banking system of the United States. So the biggest thing is that it just led to the desire for central control of the monetary system. So essentially, they are the ones that kind of regulate economic growth, making sure that everything else is like going well. Just another thing is if you look at this chart, which I think is also really interesting, you also need to recognize that the overall per capita GDP of the United States has been exponentially increasing. Um, you know, regardless of what recessions we have, on net, the overall per capita GDP has been increasing. And so that's also another thing to consider, especially when it comes down to your impacts, just because you can always argue that when you have economic growth, the average person is going to be better off. And I think you just need to list out how that's going to happen. Now, let's talk about potential F arguments. So AF arguments, I think, are interesting just because it's kind of one-sided. Uh, you just have to prove, you know, why exactly is debt bad and why is reducing debt good, a good thing? That is essentially your one goal if you were arguing AF in a round. So one thing is that uh, there are a bunch of different like arguments that you could potentially run. Um, you guys can always just pause the screen just to read over everything. But now I'm going to look over the red bold stuff because, you know, reducing debt is a prerequisite to economic growth. And so this is something that I think is going to a lot, a lot of AF teams are going to be running just because it's kind of weird because you can always like flip it around. You can always say reducing debt is a prerequisite to economic growth, but you can also say that economic growth is a prerequisite to reducing debt. And so there probably is a bunch there are probably a bunch of cards out there that say that you know reducing debt is necessary especially to increase economic growth um but i think it also makes a lot more logical sense just to say that economic growth is a prerequisite to reducing debt and so you're going to want to do a lot more research on this but you know these are just some general ideas for things that you could run now let's talk about some potential neg arguments so similarly Neg for neg, you also have a bit more breathing room, I think, just because, you know, you just have to prove that any economic growth is good and you just need to show that any reduction in the debt is bad. And so like most resolutions, I think if you're doing, if you're arguing neg, you have a bit more leniency on what you can and can't run. And I think it's easier just to come up with potential contention ideas and things like that. Um, again, like I talked about earlier with the red stuff, you know, growth is a prerequisite to reducing uh, debt. There's probably a bunch of literature out there that specifically state this. I think another important consideration, especially for this topic, is that you are going to see a lot of, like, um, I guess hypocritical literature just because you'll see stuff that's like growth is a prerequisite to reducing debt or reducing debt is a prerequisite to growth, things like that. Just like that's just one example. You know, there are probably a million of other examples and things like that to really consider and, you know, go down to the nitty gritty stuff. Similarly, I think it's also very important for you to be familiar with basic economic theories, which I think is why this topic is going to be a bit harder to debate, just because it's purely based on theory. Um, and I think either way, I think both sides are going to be able to access the same impacts at the end of the day. But like I talked about earlier, it also depends on the overall scope and magnitude of things, but also the time frame. So when considering, uh, when doing research, I definitely be aware of certain economic theories to um, talk about like the Keynesian model, uh, things like that. And then I'd also look at different impacts because I think your summary is going to be exclusively just weighing on your impacts and explaining why your impacts are much better than your opponents. And so we probably will go over a few weighing mechanisms and stuff in the later weeks coming up, cl coming closer to the tournaments. So that way you guys can have a better idea and better practice of how to weigh effectively and do it well. So that way you consistently win rounds. And so with that, I think that's the end of the topic lecture. And please leave uh, questions or comments down below and we will...
do our best to get back to you right away.